Good afternoon, lady and gentlemen. Thank you for coming today and for the, to the M&A for inviting me to give you this talk about a pair of benches. So, there they are. I've titled my talk, Mysteries and Memories, for the following reasons. First and foremost, it is to one of the memory of two young men who died at sea in what might be described as incompletely explained circumstances and therein lay the mysteries. My interest in Brinches developed soon after my wife and I came to live here at Mariner's Park. She asked me to go shopping. Uh, no, let me rephrase that. She sent me shopping to Tesco on King Street over there, a walk of a few hundred yards from the park. It was the walks back while burdened by bags and a crutch and in need of a bit of a rest that sparked my interest in benches. For there it was, exactly what I needed at that moment. On the grass and just inside the old main, main gate stands a beautifully varnished triple seat bench bearing a plaque proclaiming it to be Frank's bench. I gained an instant liking for Frank that day, that first day. But apart from his years spent on earth, it told me nothing more about the man. And I'd like to know more about his life and the lives of others who have been sighted here in their memory. And so began my new hobby, bench recognition, perhaps. Of the 27 benches, of the 27 benches I subsequently visited on the park, a common theme emerged. Their memorial plaques announced their subjects had lived for what today we would generally accept as a normal lifespan. But there are two among them that shatter that mold. Two benches that each commemorates the life of a young Bibby Line engineer officer. Robert Prescott, age 25, and Maxwell Bigham, age 26. They died in a tragic boiler explosion on the 12th of June, 1976, aboard the Liverpool Bridge, Bibby's newest fleet vessel, and just before she would have set off on her maiden voyage. On first reading these plaques, the ship's name stirred a memory, but a remembrance that did not immediately register with me. And so I set myself the task of learning more about this ship and of the two young engineers who had lost their lives on her. But where should I start? I have no personal knowledge of these men and I never sailed on Liverpool Bridge or with the Bibby Line. I really hadn't far to go in search of information. So much was readily available to me right here among the residents of Mariner's Park. In this cluster of buildings live ex-seafarers who not only knew these men, but the ship also. There is one among us today who actually served aboard her on the day of the tragedy and took an active part in the casualty evacuation operation that got Maxwell out of the engine room and into the hospital ashore. Come in, Carol, there's a seat just here. Do forgive me, I've started without you. <laughs> and so before I get into their story, I wish to thank all those who have drawn on their memories to give me information about the men and the ship to make this talk possible. I do know that for some, it was not easy to give recall remembrances that remain bitter and painful to think on even today, 46 years later. It doesn't sound enough for me to repay you, but thank you. The purpose of this talk is twofold. First and foremost, I wish to refresh and honor the memory of Robert Prescott and Maxwell Bigham. Secondly, I wish to give those of us who might sometimes sit on these benches a little background knowledge of why they are there and to leave you with a mental pen picture of the men they commemorate. It all starts with the ship, really, Liverpool Bridge, shows everything to do with this account. So let me start by setting the scene around the Liverpool Bridge at the time of her construction and the social and shipping trends for wet and dry bulk carriers in the 1970s. There she is on the stocks. The 70s were a time when ship sizes were not only on the increase, but on the considerable increase. 
History shows a marked advance in ship deadweights throughout the 1950s and onwards. For those not familiar with the expression, and in simple words, deadweight is the total weight a ship can safely load at any time. For example, let us briefly look at what was happening in deadweights in the BP fleet. In 1950, the British Adventure, a tanker of 30,000 deadweight tons, was the largest wet bulk carrier in the world. For the remainder of the 1950s, smaller ships such as British Sailor and British Skill, vessels of 28,000 deadweight tons, entered the BP fleet and were designated as super tankers. <laughs> Their captains wore Admiral's braid, one thick and three small. Can you believe it? Towards the close of the 1960s, on an impetus following the closure of the Suez Canal and the political upheavals in the Middle East necessitating longer sea voyages around the Cape of Good Hope, British Explorer entered the BP tanker list, a vessel of 215,000 deadweight tons. The very large crew carrier had arrived. A similar expansion in deadweights occurred in dry bulk carrier fleets. Although they operate in different trades, there are two features we can load as, note as common to wet or dry bulk carriers. One, there were scant prospects of obtaining a return cargo, or beg your pardon. One, load ports for both types of ship were mostly in remote locations where, two, there were scant prospects of obtaining a return cargo, necessitating lengthy ballast voyages to pick up a next cargo. Shipyards around the world looked at ways of minimizing the wasteful and expensive costs of these long ballast voyages. Swan Hunter's naval architects at Walsend bear the crown for being the first in the UK to come up with an innovative design. They produced a formula that swept away the difference between tankers and dry bulk carriers. They gave us the oboe. A vessel capable of carrying either an oil, oil or an ore or a bulk cargo. To give you an operating example, such as a vessel of say 98,000 deadweight tons, after delivering crude oil to a refinery in Baltimore, could tank clean on the short passage to Seven Islands in the St. Lawrence and there load an iron ore cargo for Port Talbot in South Wales thus avoiding a lengthy ballast passage to load an oil cargo by jumping the distinction between wet or dry ship types. Liverpool Bridge was an oboe, capable of carrying 164,040 tonnes. She was the last and largest in a series of six such ships, types built for various owners for operation in the Seabridge Consortium by Swan Hunter at the newly acquired Haverton Hill Yard on the River Tees. That was the old Furness shipyard. Liverpool Bridge was launched on the 5th of December, 1975. And after completion, handed over to owners, Bibby Line, on the 10th of June, 1976. Hi, please have a seat. For purposes solely of an important line of reasoning for the events that subsequently followed in the vessel's four-year lifespan, I would like to point out that Swan's oboe comprised of an innovative design, which means it was a new design, which means it was an untested design, which means it was never in service anywhere. So if I start turning like a union man, please catch a turn on me. So, before we delve deeper into the ship's circumstances, it's worth our while to spend a minute or two considering the possible effects on her construction of the social and political climate pertaining in the country in 1976. The year was not the best of times to be in business or even at home in the UK. It was a time of rampant wage demands, rampant inflation and rampant labour disputes. Britain was on a three day week. Rainfall had been sparse during the last autumn, and by the following summertime, the reservoirs were two thirds empty. Water and electricity were on ration. Remember that? 
Prime Minister Sonny Jim Callaghan moved Dennis Howell, the sports minister, across to a newly formed Ministry for Drought. His brief was to tackle the water shortage with public conservation advice. Those who were there may recall that Dennis, bless him, borrowed an idea from his previous job and suggested we save water by having a communal bath with a friend. Remember that one? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Internationally, Britain was not doing well either. We finally lost the Cod Wars with Iceland, bringing in its wake devastating hardship to British fishing communities. On the plus side, Concorde made its first commercial flight to the USA. What has this to do with the Liverpool Bridge, you might ask? Well, it just might have affected the quality of her finished product. That in turn might have created a causal connection with what happened to her later. 1976 was an especially bad time for Swan Hunter. Although swans were building the latest designs in marine architecture, they were struggling to stay afloat themselves financially. Swans, among other yards, became nationalized the following year. Why is it that conditions were so difficult at Swan's Teesside Yard? In fact, they were no more difficult at Haverton Hill than they were in any other British shipyard. 1976 was altogether a bad time for the country and for shipbuilding in particular. Also, Haverton Hill was not a yard noted for quality workmanship in any event during the 1970s. Added to that difficulty, the North Sea oil boom had taken off and was attracting the best shipwrights, supervisors and coded welders away from the traditional shipyards to more lucrative employment elsewhere. Quality labour was in short supply and to meet contractual deadlines, Swan's remaining labour force was put on piecework. Excuse me, I'm going to have to sit down for a little while. I wish I hadn't done that, I've lost it. <laughs> Suffice it to say that not every weld could be tested or inspected for that matter. Future experiences were later to prove the presence of shortcomings in yard workmanship aboard the vessel that point to the social and political situation prevailing at the time. These circumstances, however, lie beyond the broad sweep of our talk today. Notwithstanding these difficulties, Liverpool Bridge steamed out into the Tees in mid-May, in mid-May, to commence her sea trials in the North Sea. I'll try standing up again. No, it's okay, it's okay. Thank you, thank you. The trials did not proceed well, and the ship deviated to Hamburg for what records state as corrections and adjustments. She remained there from May the 29th until the 10th of June, 1976, 13 days. Bit of a long time for any ship in any repair yard, I would think. Her steam production system consisted of an oil-fired water tube boiler augmented by an auxiliary package boiler working in conjunction with a main engine waste heat recovery economizer. The main boiler system had suffered a low water shutdown when the economizer first went into commission. Boilermakers Babcock and Wilcox dispatched a technician to the ship to make minor adjustments and correct minor faults. Their words. He stayed aboard for three days from the 8th until the 10th of June when trials completed. The ship was finally handed over by Swans to her, her owners and she sailed for Flushing in Holland to load bunkers and stores prior to proceeding on her maiden voyage to Tuberau in Brazil to load a cargo of iron ore. During the technician's time on board, records show that the boiler system was drained, flushed out, and recharged with distilled water that contained an in initial dose of boiler water treatment chemical. Uh, the engineers among you will know all about that. Babcock's technician did not sail with the ship when she left Hamburg for flushing on the 10th of June. 
At what time did she sail from Hamburg? Well, I regret I can only guesstimate. The maritime distance from the port of Hamburg to Flushing is 382 nautical miles. She arrived and anchored at Flushing at 07.48 local time on the 12th of June. We know she was handed over at some time on the 10th of June, and she would have sailed soon afterwards. If say, however, if, say, however, this had been at noon on the 10th, and she had then sailed and made an average total speed of, say, nine knots, she would have anchored at Flushing at about the time of her logged arrival. The exact time of her departure, however, is not an important factor in the events that followed. What is important on the rundown is that an engine room logbook entry records a boiler firing lockout due to a low level in the drains tank. This was during the evening of the 10th of June on the 8 to 12 first watch. The log subsequently records for the next day, I quote, while on passage on the 11th of June, boiler works were undertaken, blowing out of Mowbray chambers. The main engine economizer was in use, but was shut down prior to arrival. Nothing extraordinary there other than to suggest things might not yet be quite right with the working of the ship's heating systems. The vessel arrived and anchored at Flushing to take on her stores and bunkers. There were no further alarms recorded in the engine room logbook for the 12th of June during the remainder of the 8 to 12 forenoon watch. This calm state of affairs changed considerably during the next watch. While at anchor, a low steam demand sufficed to provide for the ship's requirements and was produced by the auxiliary package boiler, set on low firing. Extra third engineer Robert Prescott, assisted by fifth engineer Graham Hutchinson, kept the 12 to 4 afternoon watch. Mr. Prescott had work to do on the freshwater generator and he left Mr. Hutchinson to run the watch routine while he worked on that job, both, however, were present in the engine room control room from time to time during the watch. Electrician Maxwell Bigham was also present in the engine room and came into the control room on a number of occasions. During the watch, the logbook shows that there were a number of boiler high level alarms at various times. It also documents that one or other of the watch engineers corrected them. At 14.55, Mr. Prescott corrected the fourth such alarm and entered in the log, quote, package boiler, fault, reset, OK, third engineer. Approximately half an hour later, at 15.27, Mr. Hutchinson corrected the fifth boiler fault for the afternoon watch and entered in the log, further alarm, high hot well level, fifth engineer. Mr. Prescott came into the control room while the fifth engineer was making this log entry. Mr. Bigham was also in the control room at that time. Mr. Prescott asked the electrician to help him with an unspecified job on the auxiliary boiler and they left to do it together. Mr. Hutchison would join them once he had completed his routine checks and log entries. At about 15.30, and without any prior warning, the explosion occurred. Mr. Hutchison was but two or three steps outside of the control room on his way there when it happened. Although the space rapidly filled with smoke and acrid fumes, he remained uninjured. He met up with electrician Max Bigham, who was staggering back towards the control room. Maxwell appeared to be covered in granular soot particles. Hutchison could see he had suffered severe head injuries and set about helping him into the control room. He had no sighting of third engineer Robert Prescott during those moments. P.O. steward, Malley, was working in the laundry on the second deck when the, the explosion occurred. The watertight door to the engine room from this deck was open and a fireball erupted through the doorway, narrowly missing him, and then the deck filled with smoke. The ship went to emergency stations and Malley went down into the engine room with other members of the stretcher party that included the second cook and catering boy, Tom Conway. 
They found Maxwell lying on the plates in front of the control room, being attended to by Graham Hutchinson. They witnessed Max's injuries, which included extensive scalding. To Mallet's surprise, Maxwell was wide awake, alert, and conscious of his surroundings. He talked quite normally and made no complaints at all that revealed the agony he must have been suffering. Such was the extent of the shock to his system. White smoke, bitter to the taste, coursed around the emergency team as they worked. With infinite care, Mallet's team positioned and secured Maxwell into a board of trade, bamboo and canvas, Neil Robertson stretcher. At this point, the second engineer joined them, wearing breathing apparatus. He'd been working in the steering flat at the time of the explosion. Unable to enter the engine room from there due to the thick pall of acrid black smoke, he had rushed topsides, donned breathing apparatus, and then went below. There remained a risk of fire and further explosion, and his first priority was to secure the ship from further peril. He noted that the fifth engineer, Malley, and his team had Maxwell's evacuation under control and left them to continue with his own checks. The second engineer said later that he saw the front lying off the package boiler and fuel oil leaking from inside the ruptured cylinder. Inside the boiler, he saw a bright red glow and assumed it came from the boiler brickwork exposed by the explosion. After shutting the valves, he continued his investigations and found Robert lying in front of the main boiler where the force of the explosion had deposited him. He noticed the severe injuries and burns suffered by Robert and that he was already dead. Back in the control room, the emergency party had carried Maxwell in the stretcher as far as the lift, where a fresh problem arose. How to get him inside the lift? The lift's meter square platform was designed to carry persons standing upright. It was too small to take a stretcher in the horizontal plane. They carefully brought Maxwell and the stretcher to a vertical position. Then Mally hugged, hugged the Maxwell stretcher combination to his chest, like he was suckering a child to maintain the upright position. He then slowly pigeon-stepped the resulting human assemblage into the lift and held it secure until they reached topsides. For all of the time throughout this evacuation, Malley insists Max was talking quite normally, neither complaining nor issuing any exclamations as a result of the agony his body must have been suffering. Mally noticed Maxwell's face and hands were glowing a bright pink color as a consequence of the scalding. Topsides, they found the master. Captain Willie Davis had everything organized with a shore helicopter on call, ready to whisk Mr. Bigham away to, to hospital. <laughs> I'm having a fight with this. It wants to move on when I don't want it to. <laughs> Cons with all. Excuse me. I do apologize. There was a lesser urgency to extract Mr. Prescott. His body was taken ashore by tender a little later. This whole calamity might have been building for hours or days even. Yet it had happened in seconds and was over in minutes. But why did it happen? What made the boiler explode? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I have here the official statement of facts that were presented to whatever inquiry was subsequent to this accident. It is very well written, <laughs> concise, and comprehensive. It tells of the working condition of the essential components in the boiler control systems. It does what it is designed to do, record pertinent facts for an inquiry to consider and for the inquiry then to establish the cause of the boiler's eruption. But of itself, 
it does not tell us why the accident happened. Was it a boiler fault? Was it a crew fault? What made it happen? I'm afraid at this point in time I can't tell you. I haven't yet traced the inquiry findings. I'm not an engineer, and as a Czech, I asked a double barrel chief engineer, steam and motor, to read it through in case I had missed something important and the reason is given, but in terms I had not understood. But no, he too could not find a definitive reason expressed in the document for the, bo for the boiler's explosion. During the reason for an accident, defining the reason for an accident and apportioning blame is what inquiries do and state and marine insurers demand. Why is this important in this case? After all of the time that's elapsed since it happened, simply to preclude Robbie and Maxwell from being blamed for causing the accident. If it was, if it was not due to something they did or did not do. I'm not being cynical when I say that in my experience of marine inquiries and investigations, the possibility of crew negligence appears as an early item for consideration on the agenda. Without a valid reason given by a valid authority for the boiler explosion that day, the spectre of crew negligence could remain as an open issue, and the possibility of the victims of the tragedy being tacitly blamed for its occurrence. The Derbyshire families got to know this only too well, four short years later. That is why it is important for the true reason to be found and stated officially. In this case, however, after the passage of 46 years, I doubt that anybody other than myself is asking this question. After this length of time, I do believe we can safely leave the issue to lie in the assumption that there were continuing faults with the boiler system, faults that had previously required a maker's technician to be working on board for three days prior to sailing for flushing, that there followed an alarm on the 8 to 12 watts on the 11th of June while a passage to flushing suggests a continuing problem. This suggestion is supported by no fewer than five boiler alarms when the ship laid anchor in the afternoon watch on the 12th of June, the last of which was only three minutes before the package boiler exploded. In light of which, I wish to further suggest that unless found otherwise by the competent authority at the investigation held subsequent to the explosion, that no personal blame for this occurrence ought to attach itself to those who died as a result of this calamity. What happened subsequently was that nothing more could be done for Robert, only for the family he left behind. But everybody hoped and prayed Maxwell would make a full recovery in hospital. Bibby Lyon flew his wife Mary to sit at his bedside. <coughs> Robust as he was in both mind and body, the injuries sustained proved too much for him. Recovery became not possible, and Maxwell passed away a week or so later. Mary had stayed at her husband's bedside, sharing every ensuing pain and seizure suffered by him. She sat beside him until his very last moment. Maxwell's body was later cremated in Holland, followed by a short service at sea off the Mars estuary, where his ashes were scattered on the wavelets. Robert's remains were recovered, placed in a body bag, and repatriated to the UK for committal in accordance with his family's wishes. Liverpool Bridge then returned to Hamburg for further repairs. Bibby gave the crew who remembered the choice of staying on board or of signing off articles and coming home. For those who were married and stayed with the ship, the company flew out their wives to join them for the duration of the repair period. Yet, Another mystery now raises its head. If the accident occurred in 1976, why then did it take until 2018 to commemorate its victims with these benches over there? That comes down to the ship again. In 1978, two years after the accident, she shed her Liverpool Bridge skin 
and emerged as a new maritime beast, the Derbyshire. Two years later still, in September 1980, she became overwhelmed in the Western Pacific Ocean by Typhoon Orchid and became lost with all hands. 42 crew and two wives. I'm sorry to tell you that Graham Hutchison, who was on board as a third engineer with his wife, were among those that were lost on Derbyshire. Thus, with Robbie and Maxwell, the total loss of life attributable to this Haverton Hill Yard number 57 vessel amounts to 48 souls in total. 48, because Francis Cook, the MP for Stockton in the 1970s, had Haverton Hill in his constituency. He tells us in Hansard of the two shipyard workers who lost their lives in fatal accidents during the construction of the ship. However, the sad story of Derbyshire does not belong in this talk today, but its aftermath does. On Merchant Navy Day, 3rd of September 2018, Derbyshire and those who had died on her were remembered by the raising of an exquisite Evans sculpture set out in a memorial garden at St. Nicholas Church, Liverpool. The gardens were opened that day by ex-seafarer Lord Prescott. Is that you? <laughs> However, the memorial was for the Derbyshire and her victims although Robbie and Max were remembered during the service. What about them? Did they not also deserve a, a permanent monument? Captain Dave Creamer and other members of the Bibby Line Reunion Committee carefully considered this question. Universally, they determined they should also be remembered. But how? They could not be directly included into the Derbyshire Memorial, and so the committee set about raising funds to buy a hardwood bench to site in their memory on this side of the Mersey, or should that be Mersey, at Mariner's Park. Their plans went slightly awry, however, for they failed to raise the money to buy a single bench. In fact, the appeal raised enough to buy two. And so Max and Robbie have a bench each, cited prominently either side of the park's war memorial. I must pause here to give tribute to the park's gardening team on that day. And that team included Dave, the park's present head gardener. The memorial service at St. Nicholas was all set for the 3rd of September. Representatives of the Prescott and Bigham families had been invited by the reunion committee and had confirmed their attendance, as had Lord Prescott. In this pick above, we can see Carol, Robbie Prescott's sister, shaking his lordship's hand in the memorial gardens at St. Nick's Church. By early morning on the day of the service, a huge problem emerged at the park. The benches hadn't arrived and did not do so until later that morning. What is more, they arrived in flat pack packaging and in need of assembly. The gardening team dropped what they were doing and set about assembling the benches and laying the sites for them before the family representatives arrived that afternoon. And so it was done. Well done, those gardeners. I think we've all had enough of the ship by now. One of the purposes of this talk is to leave you with a pen picture of the men who were its victims in 1976. What about those, those men? Let's start with Robbie. Robert Daniel Prescott was a local lad from Highton, Liverpool. He lived at Longview Road in that house. It's the one with the bins outside. He was the eldest of six siblings. The family was not well off and struggled to make ends meet financially. Remember, the times were bad for working families in 1976, three day week at all. Robbie proved himself to be a kind and generous son and became an essential contributor for his family. I've heard it said of him being the family's breadwinner in those days. He readily bought furniture and household items for his parents, articles they could not otherwise have had, which made their lives more comfortable. Whenever birthdays and Christmas came around, it was Robbie who ensured his siblings woke up with presents. This generosity extended beyond his immediate family, for he made sure his friend's children also had presents at these times. 
Robbie was intensely loyal to his friends. That said, I doubt anybody would call him an angel. For in addition to his generosity, Robbie was a popular and much liked for his cheerful and gregarious nature. He was a fun-loving man who liked a pint or two, and so did his close friends. They even had their own seats in their heightened local, now pulled down, now pulled down after Robbie died. Could it possibly be said that such was their purchasing power in that pub? Hmm, incredible. Here we can see Robbie in the pub with Bob Evans, and I believe, is that Steve Alston? No, it's not Steve. No. Which one? Which one? Which one? Right, with, with another friend. No, the other one is sitting down. <laughs> Fine, thank you. Robbie joined Bibbeline from school as an engineering apprentice <laughs> and trained at Southampton College, not Riversdale, as one might have expected. His caring, genial nature ensured his popularity on board ship, and he had made many lasting friends, several of whom are here in this room today. One in particular became like a brother to him. Fun-loving Robbie Prescott was always up for, for a laugh or a prank, and so was Bob Owen. Kindred spirits whenever they were together, whether ashore or on board, time off became party time for the flimsiest of reasons. To separate them in this account, I'll refer to Robert Prescott as Robbie and Bob Owens as Bob. There lay one significant difference between this pair. Robbie drank lager and Bob prefers car scales. That's about it. Here we see them on the Worcestershire, where their pranks and zest for life continued. On this ship, Robbie slept in the bottom bunk of a two-berth cabin and invited Bob and a couple of shipmates to his place for a few wets one evening. But he made the huge mistake of being asleep when they arrived. Take, <laughs> taking care not to wake Robbie, his visitors set about dismantling the spring frame from the empty top bunk and rigged it to trap Robbie into his lower bunk. They then noisily set about drinking his beer. Now wide awake and finding himself trapped in his bunk, Robbie protested loudly, but his pleas fell on deaf ears. The others ignored him until his beer had run out, and only then did they free him. Robbie greeted them with a single word, spoken through a huge grin. The word begins with a capital B and ends in arstards. <laughs> Beery nights out on the town, when on the loose in Liverpool, invariably ended with a curry. It became a mission of their nights out to find the, ship that's, the shop that sold the hottest curry. Their mission became a long-standing quest until one night, after a bellyful of beer, they found a Chinese restaurant in Lime Street and ordered its hottest curry. <laughs> After taking a mouthful, Bob says Robbie's face froze into a paling mask with beads of perspiration flowing down the sides of his nose. What's up? Bob asked. We found it, croaked Robbie. They, their quest was over. They knew where the hottest curry was to be found. It was not unusual to find them sleeping over in each other's homes. On one such occasion, Bob had to ask Robbie, shouldn't you be going home? Yeah, perhaps you're right, Robbie grumbled. They'd already been there for two days and nights. Mm -hmm. Robbie became godfather to Bob's daughter, Sarah. When she was born, Bob had been celebrating before he got to the hospital to see his wife and meet his daughter. Elaine cringed away from him in a hospital bed after being cascaded in curry and cask ale fumes. <laughs> You've been out with Robbie Prescott again, she challenged and how right she was, right up to and beyond Sarah's arrival. Robbie wasn't meant to be on the Liverpool Bridge. Bibby's had fixed him for the Canadian Bridge. But Liverpool, the Reds, had yet to play Club Brugge in the second leg of the UEFA Cup final in Bruges. If he had sailed on Canadian Bridge, he would have missed the match. Robbie was a fanatical Liverpool supporter, and he had already bought tickets for the game. He begged and pleaded with Bibbies for an alternative posting. One after the match had played, played. Bibby's personnel responded and switched his appointment to Ocean Bridge. Robbie thereby got himself to Bruges on the 19th of May to witness this important second leg match. 
The first leg had played at Anfield on the 28th of April and had resulted in a 3-2 aggregate win for Liverpool. However, that score stood to Club Brugge's favour under the away goal rule in the event of a draw in the second leg at Bruges. It proved to be a close game, the second leg, and by half-time, the score still stood at 3-2. A nail-biting second half followed, followed. In the 11th minute, horror of horrors, Tommy Smith was penalised for handball. To groans and shouts of dismay from the red stand, Lambert put the ball past Ray Clements to make it 3-3. Bruges now had the goal they needed to win the competition with a draw. Liverpool knew that, and four minutes later, Lady Luck played with them. The Reds were awarded a free kick. Skipper Emlyn Hughes regarded the field through a lowered brow and put the ball in the way of Kevin Keegan. It rolled onto Keegan's right foot that launched it past keeper Birgen and into the net. Liverpool were 4-3 on aggregate and now jubilation reigned in the red stand. There were 30 minutes left to play. Bruges went on the attack, putting everybody forward. Liverpool went on the defence, leaving only Kevin Keegan forward. The game caused the sweat to run like rivers on manager Bob Paisley, who called this half the longest 45 minutes of my entire life. Two very anxious moments occurred when Bruges broke Liverpool's defence. Lambert's sh Lambert shot beat keeper Ray Clements, but Lady Luck guided it into the post. On the second occasion when Bruges broke through, Ray Clements intercepted the shot with a magnificent diving save. The ref's whistle blew, the game was over, and Liverpool were undisputed European champions. Jubilation reigned for real in the red stand, with Robbie shouting as loud as any other red, the cost of his ticket and travel expenses, his off-pay period, and that of his next enormous hangover was fully justified. Here's a pic, here we can see a pic of John Toshak after the close of the game. Behind him is the red stand. Now, I'll give a case of beer to anyone who can pick out Robbie Prescott from that picture. Any takers? I'll give you a clue. Robbie is the one in the stand wearing this cap and this scarf. The cop, cop crowd, yeah? You got it, Carol, have you? Have you found him? <laughs> have you found him? No. Oh, right. <laughs> okay, then. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, moving on. Here's the team, here's the team coming home with a cup. And after all the trouble and anxiety they had suffered to win it, they appear to have managed to break it. Robbie never needed an excuse to hold a party, but he held a big one now. They were never selfish parties, for they invariably included wives and girlfriends. I'm informed that Elaine has given her tacit approval to show this pic of her dancing an aeronautical jive. <laughs> A surprise resignation on Liverpool Bridge saw Robbie's appointment switch from Ocean Bridge, and this shift pleased him immensely. When asked, he would say he was over the moon about it and would go about broadcasting to anybody who would listen, Liverpool Bridge, a new ship, a new ship, great! This would have been Robbie's 13th voyage with Bibby line. But he wasn't superstitious. He had organised many parties in his time, but was not in the habit of hosting farewell parties <coughs> before leaving home to join ship. But out of character, he did so before leaving to join Liverpool Bridge. There he is getting ready to go out on the, to go to his, his little fancy dress party. And here we see him ready to rock before he leaving to join ship. And we see another of that last pick's party now with the party now in full swing. 
At the end of this trip, he planned to return to Southampton to prepare for his second engineer's examination. Robbie Prescott lived life to the full. We have talked of his various escapades, but Robbie also harbored a responsible and caring side. He was ambitious and as good, if not better, with a spanner than he was with a glass. Who knows what he might have achieved had he lived. A future engineer, chief engineer, for sure. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you Robert Daniel Prescott. Now, of Mr. Bigham, while I had access to many who knew Robbie Prescott and could draw an abundance of anecdotes about him, I found the converse to be true of Maxwell Bigham. From the two ex-seafarers I found who had known him, I learned he was a quiet, pleasant, unassuming man, always cheerful, and one who never grumbled. Maxwell was born a Scot and died on Liverpool Bridge, aged 26, leaving a wife and two small children. I could find scant personal information about him and no pictures of him either. While researching for information, I received a gentle warning against approaching Maxwell's family members as his untimely death still remains an extremely sensitive issue with them. And so it is. I was to learn when finally I found and made contact with the Bigham family. It was Maxwell's son Stephen who gave me a photograph of his dad and information about his father and his family. Maxwell Bigham was born on the 4th of October 1949 into humble surroundings in a street just like the one behind. The Gorbals was recognized as one of the worst slums in Europe. Its old baronial buildings had been subdivided into festering slums and were breeding grounds for squalor. Maxwell's father had served in the Royal Navy during the war, but had later contracted cancer and died when Maxwell was nine. His mother brought him up as a single parent, along with his sister, Jessie. His mum and sister have since passed away. Against this backdrop of disadvantage, Maxwell loved books and he became a high achiever at school. There he met Mary, his childhood sweetheart, who became his wife when they were both 19 and the mother of his children subsequently. Max's son Stephen arrived in 1968 and his daughter Maxine in 1971. After leaving school, Maxwell secured an apprenticeship with electrical engineers, James Scott, where his work took him into the Clyde Bank shipyards. On completion of his apprenticeship, he went to sea as an electrician with Bankline. I believe Foil Bank was his first ship. Now, are there any ex-bank liners here? Oh, I can safely give this anecdote out then. <laughs> One memory still held by his wife Mary was of him saying that Bankline didn't operate the best ships sailing the seas, and other ships often cheered them when they chugged into port because they were rust buckets. But boy, could those boy party when they got there. His next ship, we believe, was Avonbank. Bankline trips were often long. With a young family at home, Maxwell needed shorter trips for him to be with them more often. He joined Bibby Line where he soon made his mark, which in 1976 earned him a posting to their newest ship, Liverpool Bridge, where tragically he met his end. Stephen was eight and Maxine five when their father died. They, were, they stayed in the family at home at that time while their mother, Mary, sat at their father's bedside in Holland. Maxwell's story continues by following the effects, the effects of his death on his family. His wife Mary never remarried and has remained true to Maxwell and his memory even until today. She raised Stephen and Maxine as a single parent. Maxwell's death and its circumstances remain painful to her and continue to be a highly sensitive issue within the family. If there is a vote for a hero in this chronicle, mine goes to Mary Bigham. 
She raised her children single-handedly and ensured they were well-educated. Stephen works today as a solicitor advocate with audience in the High Court of Scotland. His status is akin to a barrister in England and Wales. Stephen's speciality at law is criminal defence. Here we see him on his father's bench on the day they were assembled and cited. Perhaps he was the first visitor to sit on them, which is kind of appropriate. Stephen is married to Leslie and they have two children. Oh, you can't sit. That's not Leslie, that's his sister. Uh, two children. Maxwell 16 and Ursula 12. I managed to contact the family through Glasgow Academy where Maxwell Jr. lifted the senior fourth year prizes for Latin and mathematics last year. Maxine and her husband also have two children, Cara, 18, and Iona, 15. They were pleased their father was mentioned during the Derbyshire commemoration service in 2018. Their mother, Mary, would have liked to attend, but was fighting cancer at the time. She has since fully recovered, <laughs> Against such a stoic lady, even that filthy disease stood no chance. Ladies and gentlemen, Maxwell Bigham, a good lad. To end, ladies and gentlemen, I'll give you the memories of Robert Daniel Prescott and Maxwell James Egg Bigham, two good lads. Thank you very much.